welcome to the Inspired Evolution. And it is such a treat to be here today because I am blessed with the vibes from Sam Ma. Sam, how are you, brother? Very well. How are you? Yeah, really good, man. Really good. Really grateful to have you here today. Um, I, I, I touched in with you just before and shared, um, shared why I was so excited to have you here. But for those listening into Sam for the first time, um, he's a West Australian instrumentalist and drummer. He's better known for his unique playing style on the handpan. And that's really why we're, we're connected through that instrument. Um, before discovering the instrument, Sam had already established himself as a drummer in Australia. He worked with bands and artists such as Methyl Ethel, Katie Steele, Rabbit Island, Grace Woodruff, um, Nicholas Orr, from Tame Impala and countless other groups based in Perth. Um, in about 2014, six months after Sam received his first hand pan, he, uh, he took it travelling to the Americas, north and south. He spent about 15 months traversing from Mexico City down to the Patagonian region of Argentina, surviving mostly from the money he actually made on the streets with a hand pan. Um, and at the end of 2015, a video surfaced of Sam improvising on the, on the instrument in, uh, in the subways of New York City. And it, this video is incredible. We're going to talk about this in a sec. Um, but it actually reached over 18 million people. And uh, so from humble origins busking on the streets to documenting the instrument's powerful effect on humans around the world, Sam has now performed his boundless music in over 22 countries. He uh, recently completed a dream project collaboration with Manu de Lago, also plays the handpan, and uh, also the French production house La Blogatech. And uh, yeah, there is there is so much going on here. Directly into that video, though, I have to confess that when I first started out on the journey of the handpan, um, it was the video of yourself um, playing in um, in the underground in New York, and uh, and another similar subway sort of vibe. Um, Daniel Waples playing the video with the with the and I saw these two videos and something just inside me just went. <laughs> <laughs> Must be was, something to do with that subway resonance. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> you guys are wiser than you look. No offense. <laughs> 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 that's that humble origins i guess but yeah you guys like really thank you so much for um for just you know following through on your passions and, uh, and living that i think that's kind of what's connected us here today is uh, yeah, yeah for sure by how the instrument has been able to support and uh, and weave your life at the moment so let's touch there if that if that's yeah i mean it's it was a pretty incredible thing to happen because uh it was completely unplanned you know it was just a, a lead of circumstances that that had me down there with someone with a camera in front of me. And uh, it actually took a, a long time to even arrive on the internet. <laughs> um, it's funny how, how it works, you know, it's, it laid there dormant for over a year. And then all of a sudden one day I had to switch my phone off cause it was an endless, endless beep. <laughs> 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 it's, it's just funny how those things, um, sort of happen and it it tends to happen at the most vulnerable moments as well because I was definitely uh, I'd been traveling for a very long time at that point and I was at my end and I was like I just need to make enough money to go home and it was it was that vulnerability that led me to uh, having a viral video which is kind of strange ah and talking about um talking about moments aligning there's this moment at the very end of the video where the train actually pulls up and it's like this yeah perfect little cacophony that's created through that i know it um, was great it's really amazing so following that flow is yeah. uh is definitely a thing that vulnerability that you talk about so is that is that a part of the creative process um um, I, th I think that it, it definitely is. I mean, um, putting my stuff aside, I think that any sort of art that's generated from uh, the depth of someone, it's usually coming from the purest, purest place, you know, um, that I tend to uh, gravitate towards any, any sort of artistic endeavor when it's, when it's been created from a pure place um, with no intentions of succeeding. It just, it happens very naturally. I find that that's when art's most reactive. So in a way, I mean, with that New York video, I was literally getting around making money on the streets um, for over a year. So it was, it was this period of vulnerability to an extent. Um, and it's, it's amazing how that piece reacted with so many people because it was completely from the head. You know, it wasn't, wasn't planned. It was just a guy saying, hey, I've got a camera. Um, do your thing for about five minutes. So I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, and it, it's, it's funny because I've sat there and um, recently and like written out things and planned things and they don't seem to have the same reaction with people. It's, it's that New York piece that tends to, to really grab people. 
Mm. So it's an interesting thing. Spontaneity, yeah, interesting. Yeah, totally, totally. So can you tell tell me tell us more about like what because um, you're all of a sudden you're you're traveling the Americas with this instrument like like mm-hmm. music was always was a part of your thing and like busking or like what was what was the template here what was going on? Well, I didn't really um I didn't really busk ever until I found the handpan. Um, I was I was really uh, before I decided to sell everything and leave on this trip I. I was really burning the candle at both ends because I was playing in about five bands. I was working full time. Um, and I was just really, I was just really burnt out and I had this huge desire to leave and just escape for a while. Um, and that's around the same time that I, I found the handpan and, uh, it was completely my chance that I, I found out it had this sort of unique power to, to grab people. Um, and to, to really open up new worlds. Like I was, I was stuck in a rainstorm the day that I received the instrument and I was so excited that I had to rip it out of its box and go, I just need to play it. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I sat down on the side of the street and just started playing it. And all of a sudden people would sort of gather around and I had an older Aboriginal woman sit down next to me and she was weeping. And I just, it just opened up so many, so many worlds for me in that instant. And I was like, I could just travel with this thing and I'm sure I'll get by. So I did and it, it worked. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So you, you like love at first sight sort of thing. <laughs> it really was. I mean, it, it took me, um, like I first saw uh, Daniel Waples' videos as well. He was the first player that I was like, what is this strange instrument? <laughs> and, you know, being a drummer, I was obsessed with the idea of it's this portable drum that makes beautiful melodies. Mm. And in my head, I, I just knew I had to have one. It took me took me a good year and a half to two years before I finally got one. So when I did pick it up from the post office, I, I couldn't control myself. I had to <laughs> get it out as soon as possible, you know. I totally resonate with this. I, um, I got, I've got a couple of handbands and uh, as soon as I get them, I'm like filming myself going to the post office, filming myself grabbing it <laughs> and then sending it Classic. back to the maker, just going, yo, like, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and actually on that note, there's something I'd love to reflect about handbands and just have a chat with you about, like we will dive deeper into your story, but um, just like I would do handpans and I say this again and again, even if it wasn't for the instrument, the community worldwide is just mm. something else. Yeah, it's it's very strong. I mean, I I feel extremely removed from it being from Perth, which is, uh, as you know, being in Australia, it's the most iso- one of the most isolated cities yeah. in the world. So to reach these communities, it's it's kind of hard for me, which is strange because I'm considered part of it very strongly. Uh-huh. Um, but it is such a supportive, beautiful, open uh, group of people. And uh, I think that at this time specifically, now that it's reaching the conscious of the public more than just the inner circles of the community, it's it's a really exciting time to be a part of it all for sure. Yeah, and that uh, results in uh, handpans becoming more and more available as well. Mm, like totally, yeah. Notice the gathering that we have in Australia, like Pan Oz is really like flourishing and growing every year. There's more and more people coming and even more individual yeah. artists coming to support the work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, awesome. So you've wound your way into, so it went from busking. And so where does, like, does the handpan continue on the journey at the moment or where's, like, how's it all going at the moment? Yeah, well, right now I'm I'm actually trying to take the instrument and, and sort of reestablish the rules of, of how people play it. Um, I'm working a lot with electronics and creating textures from the acoustics of the instrument. Um, so I haven't really, uh, besides private events and um, performances on the street, I haven't really unleashed myself to the, the festival, the handpan festivals that go on worldwide because I've never felt 100% ready to, to unveil something unique. So by the time that I'm ready, I would like to, to throw something out there that hasn't been done before. And I, I feel like there's a really beautiful match going on between handpan music and electronic music. Um, so I'm really, I'm touching, I'm getting in touch with my more experimental side now that I've got the chops to, to do yeah, it. Yeah, you know, so. awesome, awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's, a good, it's a good little creative um, ambition of mine to, to unleash something very unique into the world. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. Was that an ambition that was always there, brother? Like, were you always, like, was, was, was creativity always your natural state of being or? 
I think so. I mean, I, I, I rode the wave of the busking thing for obviously when I was traveling and then um, when I came back, it was all of a sudden I was known for, for being a hand pan musician, which was really bizarre to me. You know, I had tens of thousands of people following me on Facebook um, and the social media thing really, I'd never imagined myself being a viral artist. So all of, us, all of a sudden I had this uh, almost like an identity on my head that I recognised, but it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to be known for. I want to be known as a great handpan musician, but I would rather be known for a handpan musician that pushed the boundaries rather than just sat on the street busking, if that, if that uh, makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, um, I think that the success of that, that, that video has really given me the platform to have the confidence to be able to explore those, those places which is what I'm deep into right now. So I'm pretty excited to, to show the world. Wicked. And what inspires you to continue on this journey? Is it just the creativity for what is the next frontier? Uh, I just can't imagine my life not having anything to do with music. It's, I mean, I've been drumming for a long time in so many different groups and uh, music is a huge part of what I do and it's a huge part of my life. I collect records, I, I consume a lot of music um, to not create it, which I, I stopped creating music for two years and I think I, uh, I, think I pretty much went insane. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I've just realised it's, it's a part of my life that will never go away and it's... Um, it, it's, it has to stay for the sake of my sanity, for sure. Can I ask you what was the impetus to stop creating music for a while, perhaps? Um, I think anyone that's uh, sort of thrown themselves into a different world for a long enough period of time that it's no longer a holiday, it's, uh, you know, it's a thing. Um, returning from such a, a, a journey and coming back to your life, which is usually pretty regular you know the same as what it was when you left two years ago it can be a very disorienting thing and I remember returning from South America after having so many um, profound experiences and personally inside myself achieving so much and you know just absorbing the world on a level that I don't feel like a lot of people get to in their life Mm. Um, seeing everyone doing the same thing, talking about the same stuff, the same circles and also good friends sort of separating and just the the whole world you return to can be really disorienting. I I think you have this idea that people will be extremely interested in the life that you've led for the last year, but most often people are caught up in their own. So um, I just really was off anything to do with music. when I returned because I'd done it so intensely and I feel like people didn't really care about it. Um, it was really that video when it went viral that kicked me up the ass and said, no, you, the universe is telling you, you have to do it now. Mm. So it was, you know, it was, a, um, it was an extremely disorienting two years I had after I returned. I couldn't really figure out who I was anymore. I felt so different yet. Everyone was so the same. Yeah. Um, so I think that really stunted me for a while. Do you think that partially has, um, and I'm not, um, like, I'm just being an Aussie <laughs> and uh, just calling it out is, I guess. Um, I'm originally from a place called Adelaide <laughs> and uh, you might have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like, I think that's kind of, I felt um, like now I live in Melbourne, um, primarily just because of more, like, creativity is easier to explore, like even having a podcast, creating music, mm-hmm. like we host music jams in our house and people tend to gravitate towards them. Um, and I like, it's a, it's a very specific kind of music, you know, it's more devotional type of like reverence type sort of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. That sounds really lame, but it's heaps of fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, like I, I, I just reflect a lot oftentimes on like what it would be like to continue, like if I would have not left Adelaide five years ago and just um, stayed in that. And I remember when I did visit Perth, um, it sort of had the same tempo as Adelaide. Like it was. Mm. Lower. Yeah, definitely everybody's sort of like I've got a lot of friends back in Adelaide and no disrespect to them, but they're very happy to sort of have the house, have the career. Um, and not really like a lot of them will never leave Adelaide. They'll just, you know, white yeah. type sort of, sort of living. Um, so I can appreciate what you're saying in terms of, you know, you haven't traveled and then come back and then still feeling like, Oh, there's a lot of people that are just still doing the Joneses and there's all these shifts that I've had inside me and it kind of doesn't assimilate as well, perhaps. Yeah, totally. Um, and I, um, 
I'm from an even smaller place than, than Perth. I was born up in Tom Price, which is a tiny town in the north. So it's even more so relevant there. You know, like a lot of people from my childhood have, they were happy to settle. I'd never really had that bone in me. I've always sort of got to be on the move, you know. <laughs> um, I think a, another thing was uh, I, I battled with envy a little bit when I returned because a year of my life was taken away to this really pure growth period for myself and, you know, experiencing the world. Whereas some people that stayed back who I was involved with ended up becoming very successful musically. And I think that uh, I had to, for the first time in my life, deal with a little bit of anxiety and, uh, and envy, which I'd never really confronted before. Um, so I, I suppose it's that sort of, uh, small town thing when someone does well and everyone stops and goes, Oh, why can't I be that person? So yeah. that was a huge, huge impact that had a huge impact on me. Um, and I was my moms after that, like, how could you be angry for your friends succeeding? You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was, it was this great uh, tug of war that I had inside of me that I had to get through before I decided to start up again. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. that That's all right. How's um, what got you through that? Was it you know the 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 the, the dive charge of your video going viral, and then you sort of assimilated back in? Or well, not really. I mean, um, I still I still struggle every now and again with it. Um, but it was just a matter of staying true to to my creativity. You know, like by sitting there being bitter and not sort of having an outlet for it, that was the most poisonous thing. And, you know, that was the period where I just decided to work for two years instead of doing anything musical. It was really when I made that step and said, no, I'm going to start up again. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start playing with bands. I'm going to start working with the handpan again. And I started traveling all of a sudden all of these opportunities opened up and all of a sudden people uh, getting back in contact with me to do things. It was that decision to harness the feelings I had and turn it into something artistic, like music that, uh, that helped me. And, you know, that's what I said before is I think I realize now that my, my life is a void without, without having music in it. (laughs) <laughs> that's amazing and so is that the is that the like almost the advice piece for anybody that gets stuck is just take some action or totally like even if you're even if you're a person that isn't creative you know um find something that's an outlet for some people it's sport you know for some people it's cooking uh just just find the thing that that makes you bleh, you know <laughs> splurt yeah. it all out and unleash it into something that you create um, I think that's one of the, the unique things that humans have is that they have an outlet of creativity that they can turn their emotions into and reflect it in, in things. Um, music's definitely one of them. Art's one of them. Some people it's architecture, you know, some people it's getting buff at the gym, you know, there's so many, there's so many forms of outlets and I think it's important for every person to have one. And so, like, it seems like traveling is a bit of a theme in all the, in your creativity and your process as well. Can mm. you share a little bit about that and what comes up? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, growing up in such an isolated part in Tom Price where there's, you know, 800 people, uh, it's, it's basically just bush. Um, any, anywhere to go from there is a long travel. You know, you have to, the closest city was two days driveway. Um, so, I think traveling or being on the move is always part of what I do. And I love exploring new places and being introduced to new cultures. The idea of being able to do that um, and also do something that I really, really enjoy, that's sort of the dream come true, you know. (laughs) Uh, Sometimes I have to pinch myself that that's actually what I'm doing now. So um, I think think it comes hand in hand for me uh, to consider myself successful uh, I feel like I need to constantly be exposed to new worlds and new cultures. Ah. So I, I'm pretty blessed to be able to have that. <laughs> so can I ask you, like, that, that um, you just remarked that you, you do feel blessed for that. So travelling and doing what you love and allowing that to sort of, um, like, that becoming your norm, like, what, what values or what qualities do you think were in there that sort of helped guide that again and again is there like temperance or just faith or like how did you end up i think it's just the uh 
the being able to let go of fear I think is a huge one. I think fear holds a lot of people back in life. Um, you know, people are scared about if you get rid of everything and you go overseas, like what's going to become of your finances or like, will you have, will you have job security or, you know, will you miss any sort of significant event in your family? You know, will babies be born and I won't be there. I, I think that all stems from a very deep rooted place of fear. And, um, I was petrified when I, when I first sold everything and went overseas. I was so, so scared that that was the end of my end of everything that I knew, you know, but it's just so important, I think, to experience the world. I mean, we've, we've got one, we live on the same planet. Everyone lives on the same planet. It's the only, the only planet we know. Everything we've known in history, every person that you've ever admired has lived on this same place. And I, <laughs> I think it's very important to expose yourself to different cultures and, and different, uh, you know, different people because I think having empathy is probably the most important thing one of the most important values for me and travel is a definite way to achieve empathy. Yeah. Wow. I love that. <laughs> Cause, <laughs> yeah. Cause for travel for me is all about humility. It's like whenever I go to a new Yeah, totally. Just like I drop into like, man, I don't know anything, <laughs> you know, it's like all these things that I thought were true are just relative social construct you mm. know? and you go to a new place and like, it's just like they think they live, they behave in completely different social constructs. And it's like, mm. I didn't even. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's good to be uncomfortable. You know, I think it's, it's a good trait for a human to be okay being uncomfortable <laughs> at times. <laughs> Um, the older, the older I get, I don't want to be as uncomfortable as I was, you know, five years ago. But, uh, <laughs> I think, I think it definitely breeds a, a special quality in a person when they accept the circumstances that they're put in and, um, they make the best of those circumstances. Yeah. That's and I think travel brands for sure. Amazing. And so do you think, um, just like just riffing now, like, do you think perhaps being un- like that, that desire to get less and less comfortable is kind of like that's just the aging process or like what's going on there? Like, cause if, you know, just keeping it fresh and staying uncomfortable, perhaps that's like an instrumental part of vitality. Yeah. I'm not really sure. I think, um, like I understand, uh, people that have, you know, for example, like I, I think our parents sort of generation, maybe they're not so comfortable, uh, going on a trip that, they would in their early twenties, you know, because you get, you get different, um, you know, you have different values about how you should be traveling. Um, a lot of people, especially in Australia, a holiday for them is to go to a resort and be pampered. You know, um, that to me is not traveling. Traveling is, uh, letting yourself go into another culture and just being completely open minded, which is an extremely hard thing to do for anyone. For me, it is too. Um, I don't know what it is that drives that in me and I know it's not for everyone, but, uh, I do realize the value that everyone gets when they get to that point and they let themselves go. Yeah. I, um, one of my earliest memories was, uh, was traveling and, uh, um, I'm in India and I'm in this hostel and there's these German backpackers and uh, they're like going out partying, but I don't speak a lick of German, right? <laughs> and so I'm just watching them in the hostel and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, I'm an extrovert, so I'm like, I really want to go party tonight. And uh, I just, I didn't strike up the courage to have that conversation with them to go out. Yeah. And uh, they left and uh, afterwards I was like, I went up to my room and I'm like reading my little book, you know, and just like just spending time just sitting there just feeling low but also lower because I didn't take any action, you know. I was like I could have just, it would be so easy to ask and go and have a great night but I never took the action. And back then like I used to love going out. Now it's like slow down like you said, the value's changed. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then I I clearly remember that moment. It's almost like a solemn vow. Like I didn't even make it. It just dropped in. It was like that's not going to ever happen again again you know like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like, he had a classic introverted reaction <laughs> <laughs> it was just like yeah i feel like you know i'm gonna make it like if, if an opportunity presents itself in any shape way or form like i'm gonna go out and make something of that opportunity um yeah with myself back um just because of some level of uncomfortability as you were sharing mm, totally i think um i think that is part of the challenge or the struggle for me is that i'm i'm not so extrovert I, th- I feel like i'm an introvert but i'm an 
extroverted introvert, if that makes sense. Yeah. You, when I'm you around the people, to, you've worked out how to extrovert, but you are an introvert. <laughs> totally. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm around the people that I feel comfortable with, you know, I could, I'm an extrovert, but, uh, quite often, um, I'm very introverted, you know, and I think that's an extra step to the challenge of, um, being around people that are in worlds that are slightly uncomfortable is it, it challenges you personally and it's, it all adds to your growth, you know? Um, I found that uh, I didn't really go out and party a whole lot when I was traveling because I was more in, I wanted to hang out with locals. That was my, that was my main thing. I, I got caught in the web of being around other backpackers, but this is where the busking thing really came back into it because I would dedicate, you know, two hours a day just to sit on the street and play the instrument. I worked out a way to communicate with so many people that I couldn't communicate with verbally but you still sort of gather some sort of connection. Um, so having, you know, having that daily, just like being exposed and connecting with all these people from totally different walks of life through the language of music, mm. that was a really, really heavy thing for me to witness. So when I'd go back to a hostel or something and just see you know, backpackers drinking, I'd be like, nah, I'm not into that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got all the people out there, you know? Um, yeah. So it was, that was a really beautiful thing. I, I, I sort of miss that side of the instrument. You know, I feel like I don't, I, I feel like I can't sit down on the streets anymore and busk because um, there's, there's almost like a, a pressure of me to, to be a step above that now with, uh, you know, now that I'm a little bit more well known. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had that, I've had that thing before where people have caught me out on the street here and free and they're like, Oh, you're still doing that. <laughs> and you're just sort of like, Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. There's a, there's something you touched on in there about the language of music as well. And uh, mm. a big part of um, like uh, my partner and I, we travel to Brazil every year now in February just to go spend a month in the rainforest to go make music. There's like a bunch of musicians from all over the world will come together and, Make music she plays the guitar like really well and mm-hmm. um we uh it's just this amazing thing that happens it's like because there's people from portugal people from brazil spain england the states australia like all these mm. different people all these different languages and obviously we don't all speak each other's languages but when we're singing songs like it might be a spanish song but if like someone's drumming like i'll be drumming for for a, for, a, for a spanish song the minute that like everybody clicks in it's like this the dialogue is just open and they're like, everybody's yeah. talking to each other through music. Yeah, and totally. The most profound thing I've ever experienced to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that totally. Like, uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of watching live music. Um, and it's, it's one of those things that when I watch a, a group that's really, you know, they're really clicked in with each other. I don't see it as uh, a bunch of musicians. I see every instrument having a conversation or, you know, trading questions and answers to each other. (laughs) Um, It's a really cool way to look at uh, any sort of music, you know, having conversations because it is a language that everyone understands, you know, uh, Drum, drumming in particular was the first form of communication, you know. Uh, so there, there is a language to it and I think that's the coolest thing about it. And so with your pieces in that conversation, are you trying to tell stories or are you trying – like, is that – Yeah, I think um, I've always been a fan of twisting the, the mood almost, you know. So having like maybe you're setting up a, a really like mystical – or sad or mysterious sort of mood. And then I, I like finding the crucial point to twist that around and like bring a little bit of light in, for example. So I'm always, I'm always looking for the, you know, the push or pull or the, the question and the answer. Um, it, it's really cool. Like I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, meditative music as well, like a lot of ambient music. But I feel like um, the music that really affects me is one that has like a really big dynamic or melodic shift so that the mood is completely flipped on its head. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's always what I'm looking for, particularly when I'm looking at tunings of hand pans. It's like, I want to find the one that doesn't sit at the same mood that has like a certain way to be manipulated, to twist into a, a new world. Yeah. Amazing. I love that. I was already like, all my brain is all like tunings, tunings, tunings. Can't wait to talk to you about it. And I was like, maybe it's not so relevant to the audience. So like, <laughs> Another chat to be had. Well, I mean, I guess um, just touching on it a little bit, I'm, 
a lot of people when they're looking to buy a hand pan, that's the first thing that pops in the head and they're asking me like, what tuning should I get? Um, it's, it's an extremely personal yeah. preference, you know, I it's, say the one chooses the wizard <laughs> is like the only way exactly. I can really describe it. <laughs> exactly. And I, I feel like the hand pans that, um, like the tunings of the instruments that I've gotten that, um, really, really resonated me, uh, with me were the ones that, uh, sort of showed me how to play it, not the other way around. Mm. A few tricks that I apply to every pan and I can tell instantly which one is going to blend with me the best. Mm. Um, oh, my internet connection is unstable. Do you hear me? Uh, I hear you just fine. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I, I feel like the instrument sort of teaches me how to play because all of the notes are right there and you just got to find a way to, to, to make them shine, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I play with a, a lot more instruments now at the same time, so it's mm. a it's a touch harder than just having the individual pan, um, which yeah. has been really fun to to figure out. Yeah, such an inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, like, I could sit here and riff with you all day, but <laughs> I want to <laughs> honor the time that you have as well. So, is there a message in your heart that you really want to share? Um, and there's a space for it. Is there something that you want to share with everyone? I guess. Uh, I would like to, if for all the people listening out there is to just trust the things, uh, doesn't matter what it is, trust those things that make you feel really, really good when you do them. Um, as I said before, I think it's very important to have any sort of outlet and it can be something as small as maybe you like digging holes in the backyard. If just, you know, find something that, uh, really makes you, feel good or something that you can put your emotions into because uh, I think mental health problems is very big these days, particularly in the age of social media and constantly having to live up to certain expectations. So um, there's been no more important time to, to find something for yourself that works. Oh my God. Thank you so much. That is, I can't believe how much that resonates with, with everything. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, Thanks. Um, yeah, and just on, on the space of gratitude, thank you for, for like, or like obviously today and taking the time and energy to. Yeah, thanks for having me. Your wisdom and your story, but also the, like, the work that goes into, you know, being you and like just showing up so vulnerable about your past and stuff that has happened along the way and your creative process and sharing that so openly and about where it's headed. And obviously the future, like, wishing you all the best on that as well, bro. Thanks, um, man. It's a, yeah, nice, nice to speak to you. <laughs> I've got one, uh, one lucky last question, um, which is my which question that I ask everybody. Um, it's esoteric in its nature. Um, mm-hmm. so it's like beyond, beyond the hand pans, beyond the instruments, beyond the music, who is Sam Ma? Oh, isn't that the ultimate question that everyone's trying to find out? <laughs> I don't really know, man. I think, uh, I think that's, that's all part of the, the reason why I'm out here doing my thing. You know, everyone's just trying to figure out who they are. I think everyone's trying their best. I think that's one thing to always remember if you see someone that maybe didn't, you know, act too well last night or, you know, you see a homeless person on the street, I think you have to just realise that everyone is doing their best. Um, And I guess that's what I'm doing to try to figure out who the hell I am. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing, brother. Thank you so much. for. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What's the, um, if someone wants to get in touch with, with you or your music, is the easiest way to just find you on YouTube or is there a way? Yeah, I think um, the, main, the main outlets I'm using is probably Facebook at the moment. That's where most people follow me. I've, I'm, I'm starting to get used to the Instagram thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm you and me both. I'm <laughs> starting to pump out a little bit of content. So, um, yeah. yeah, if you're interested, just look up my name on either of those. You'll find my email address and links to YouTube videos when they arrive. So. Perfect. That's yeah, Sam S S A M M A H E R tribe. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Love of the Inspired Evolution and sharing the Love of the Inspired Evolution. If you feel like this content may support, has supported you or may support anyone else that you know may resonate with the content of it, please share away and share the love around. Thank you guys so much. And to stay up to date on whatever's coming out with the Inspired Evolution, please subscribe. There's all these links in the bio for you to tune into the episodes and all these different platforms just so the message can get to you and your loved ones. Thank you so much for all your love and support. Stay inspired. Tool of Bowl.